Um. <sighs> okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I just had to get that out of my system. It was a little bit of overload there. Actually, no, we gotta do it one more time. Okay, okay. All right. We're good this time. All right. <laughs> Sorry. A lot of stuff to process this week. All right. Uh, let's just get into it then. One Piece Chapter 1086 Review titled The Five Elder Stars or The Five Elder Planets or The Gorosei. In fact, you know what? Let's just address that right now. So, um, as probably most people assumed, given the naming scheme of St. J. Garcia Saturn, uh, the five Gorosei are named after planets or they have planet references in their name in some way. So, uh, just the kanji that is used in their name, Sei or Hoshi, is usually read as star, but it could also refer to any heavenly body, any heavenly body that emits light or reflects light that is neither the sun or the moon could refer to Sei or Hoshi. So planet is kind of included in that category. It's neither the sun or the moon and it does reflect light. And so we're gonna get the names of the Gorosei in this chapter. All of them, that's right, we're getting all five, big deal, uh, big news, and uh, another piece of big news is that Oda will be going on break uh, for four, five, six weeks. I, I think it's really just, he's getting eye surgery done, so I think it's whenever he's fully recovered from that, and he can actually draw manga again, then we'll, we'll address that at the end of the chapter, uh, but there's going to be another big break for One Piece after this, but do not worry, this chapter, uh, Oda makes sure to get our fill of One Piece before he heads off to get his eye surgery so um yeah we'll address that more at the end but yeah so five elder planets five elder stars kind of a varying translation here but i think both of them kind of fit given what we're going to see here um the cover page is just the straw hats hanging out uh you know during a rainstorm there's a rainbow choppers playing in a puddle it's really adorable okay that's great fantastic okay it's a nice color spread but moving on to the chapter we got a lot of stuff to cover today as you can already tell all right so um, we begin as the narrator uh, narrates over the reverie, or the conclusion of the reverie, and he's like, And so, the curtain of this year's reverie comes to a conclusion. So, we see the full establishing shot of Castle Pangea, once again to really just reiterate how big Castle Pangea is. I mean, it's huge. I mean, it towers above every other structure in Marijua. Um, We have Igaram, Chaka, and Pell, members of the Alabasta Corps running around the city trying to find Vivi, and they haven't heard anything from Cobra either. So we have Igaram. Poor Igaram, dude. I really feel bad for that guy. He was, like, in charge of keeping Vivi safe while they were working undercover at Baroque Works, and then, you know, everything happened at Whiskey Peak, and then Igaram apparently died uh, in a big explosion, and then Vivi, you know, he had to trust Vivi to the hands of pirates, who he just met, by the way. So it was really stressful for Igaram there, and now he's lost Vivi all over again, so he's running around the city with pictures of Vivi, just like, have you seen Princess Vivi? La, la, Princess Vivi, anybody? She has blue hair, which is usually very, uh, not, not a natural hair color, but in this world it is, but still, have you seen her? You know what I mean? And then uh, we also have Chaka. Chaka's just going up to one of the, the pinhead guards, like the regular guards in the armor with the pinhead, and he's just running up to them and just like, where's, where's King Cobra? Where is he? So Chaka's going more Jack Bauer with it than, than Igaram is, and then we just have Pell in his uh, falcon form scouting from the air trying to see what's going on, okay? So they're looking for Vivi. She's missing. Cobra, we don't know anything about him. Um, and so they're obviously, they're, they're not going to get to the bottom of this. Also, I have a question. Um, you know, uh, who's watching Alabasta right now? Who's the one in charge of Alabasta? We, we addressed this during the stream, but, uh, you know, Igaram, Pell, and Shaka are like the highest members of the court, and they're all at Reverie. Uh, Cobra is dead, and Vivi is missing. So uh, who's going to who's gonna be in charge of Alabasta Kingdom? Uh there, there's Terracotta, who was uh, Igaram's wife, uh, is Igaram's wife. They're still happily married. Um, I guess she could run it. Uh, Karu? Where's Karu in all this? Karu did not leave with Vivi, I think. Karu is on... You know what, Karu? It's time to live up to your birthright, Karu. It is time for you to be the new king of Alabasta. 
I think he'll do fine, ladies and gentlemen. I think Haru, I think he has the disposition for it. I think he'll be all right. We cut to a couple months in the future, and it's just like, hey, uh, Alabasta Kingdom, what's going on? Ah, uh, well, we've had a duck basically rule everything for the last couple of months, but you know what? Everything's fantastic. Economy's doing really well. Unemployment's way down. The infrastructure and transportation is doing swimmingly right now. This duck knows where it's at, you know what I mean? Um, honestly, the, the, the smartest move, and I don't know if they would do this, but uh, is probably Koza, who is the leader of the rebellion at Alabasta. I mean, he's good at leading people. He knows where what he's doing there and everything like that, you know, and so I don't know if they would just make him the new or like acting ruler, but that, that is probably the smartest move because Koza would really kind of understand how to rule a nation. Um, but who knows? Who knows? It might be in complete disarray right now until everybody gets home, okay? So uh, meanwhile, while Igaram, Chaka, and Pell are looking for Vivi, uh, we have all the other kings and queens and royalty heading back on their ships to go home, back to their home kingdoms, and the narrative narrator comes on and says there is a slew of stowaways on various royal vessels trying to get the hell out of Marijua because the only way to really escape Marijua um, is, is to get on a boat and go back to you know one of these kingdoms that the that the, uh, the royalty is from. Uh, so we have Vivi and Wapple, and I originally assumed like because last time you know Wapple was just running away with Vivi, Vivi actually climbed in Wapple's mouth, which number one is not very sanitary, and number two is very dangerous, but. Vivi Vivi, man, she had to get out of there somehow. I um, I pictured a scenario where Wapple just keeps running in a straight line, like he just does not stop and eats anything in his way, eats through Castle Pangea, eats through every tree in the forest and every rock that gets in his way, and then they just fall off the side of the red line, and then Morgan's uh, airship in the World Economic Times, just they land on top of that balloon and they just pick them up and they just leave. So that's not quite what happens. Um, Wapple and Vivi stow away on a ship heading towards the Aegis Kingdom, all right? So you might recognize that Aegis uh, is, uh, you know, Cypher Pole Aegis Zero. I think it's the same word here. Aegis is a shield or some some type of object. In some contexts, it's a shield. In other things, it's like a, a cloak or some kind of symbol worn by Zeus and Athena in Greek lore. So because all of the different kings and queens in the countries in the One Piece world are based off of nations in our world in one way or the other, um, I like to think that Wapple and Vivi stowed away on the ship that is parallel to the nation of Greece in our world. So Wapple and Vivi are heading to Greece, except they're really not because Wapple also has a Denden Mushi that he's using to communicate with Morgans. You can imagine that Morgans, you know, he was, he was, I would imagine looking for one of the kings or queens that would be willing to leak information from the Reverie to him. And Wapple was probably number one on that list. So they have a communication network. And so Wapple is like, Hey there, Morgans. Uh, yeah, we're on a uh, we're on the Aegis Kingdom ship, and so Morgans is like, ah, cool, cool, perfect. I'll swing on by and pretend I'm doing a scoop, and then you guys can sneak on my airship and get away. But make sure you're not caught. And so Wapples, Wapples, like, okay, sure, fine. And so meanwhile, Vivi. You know, it's interesting. Vivi hates Wapple because we've all, you know, you've all read Drum Island, right? Uh, Wapple pretty much stands for everything Vivi is against when it comes to how you rule a nation, how you become a king. Uh, there's also the whole flashback where Wapple pretty much just slapped Vivi when she was a child, you know, on the ground at Reverie. Uh, this was back when the Reverie Council, they couldn't afford a big table yet, so they just had to use a regular long-ass, like, cafeteria table. It was the round table came later, you know what I mean? But, like, that was, like, eight years ago, that Reverie. So, you know what's fascinating is, is Vivi really genuinely hates Wapple. Hates him as a person, hates him as a ruler, hates him in pretty much every capacity. But right here, she's just kind of all business because she has more important stuff to worry about than her hatred for Wapple. So, you know, she's probably not happy that she has to spend time with him and she had to escape with Wapple, but hey, she had to get out of there somehow. So she's just like, hey, Wapple, what did you see? What did you see? Did you see my father? What's going on? And Wapple's not saying anything. Wapple's just like, oh, you, you think I would tell you anything? I'm not telling you shit. I hated your dad and I hated everything he stood for. I'm not saying anything, right? So I feel like eventually, you know, Vivi will pressure Wapple, probably with bodily harm. You know, like Vivi takes out her peacock slashers and she's like, all right, listen here, old man. We're not playing games anymore. We're in the final saga of One Piece. I want answers. So I'm, I'm sure Wapples will, will eventually, he'll sing as it were, and he'll tell Vivi and Morgan's everything. Uh, that's by the way, the whole reason 
reason why Morgans is putting his neck out here to rescue them, because this is dangerous from Morgans' perspective, too, you know? And so, Wapples telling him, he's like, oh, I, I saw some stuff go down in the empty throne room, man, and Morgans is like, oh, I can't wait to hear about it. So, you know, Morgans, I mean, Wapple has to pay to get a ride on Morgans' ship. He's not nice enough to just let them stow away on his ship as fugitives. And they mentioned that there is a now a worldwide manhunt, essentially, for Wapple. So, Morgans better be getting good payment out of this in the form of an amazing story, or otherwise he's not helping anybody out. That's just how Morgans rolls, right? Okay, and you don't mess with big news, Morgans. Um, Vivi also asks, hey, can I borrow that Den Den Mushy? I need to make some calls. I need to make sure my dad's okay. I need to get in touch with him. Vivi does not even know her dad is dead yet, okay? So that she's still, like, th that happens later uh, when we see Wapple and Vivi at the World Economic Times and Vivi's wearing that, like, journalist outfit. They mention that she found out just the day prior to that and she was crying and then she's kind of collected herself, you know, when we saw her and Wapple at Morgan's place and now they're talking about stuff. So she hasn't even learned her dad's dead yet. She just has no idea. She's just trying to get away from Cypherpool and she mentions, hey, Cypherpool Zero is looking for me now. You, we managed to get away, but they're not just going to let me leave. Okay, these are the, this is the best um, intelligence gathering operatives in the entire world. They are going to be looking for me. So we got to really play this low cover here. Okay. Uh, in fact, we now cut back to Marijois, where we see a member of Cypher Pole Zero, the dude that has the flowery head. Uh, his name is Gizmonda, and named after a uh, play, I believe a... It's, it's the poster for a French melodrama, and uh, that's where the basis of Gizmonda's design comes from. Uh, but yeah, Gizmonda's there, the flower dude, and he's going around with an image of Vivi as well, be like... Have you seen Princess Vivi? And there's one of the royalty that are looking at Vivi's picture and just like, oh my god, she's pretty. And just like, okay, can we just move this along? Have you seen her or not? Uh, okay, all right, next person. You know, also Gizmonda, if you watch the uh, Heart of Gold One Piece special, he actually gets a lot of uh, screen time there fighting against Mad Treasure. He's kind of like Batman, so there you go. Uh, we also have uh, Spondum. We love Spondum, right? I mean, I'm telling you what, if I ever see a comment every video it's always man teching where is spondum at i want to see more spondum in one piece right well here he is right now spondum is walking around with another agent uh we don't see the other agent's face um but uh we uh, have uh, pictures of sabo and so they're going around looking for sabo all right i would imagine i look at spondum as kind of like the intern of cypher pole zero like he can't fight and he can barely you know gather information so they're like okay spondum listen we need to find Sabo, so take this wanted poster, take this picture of Sabo, and just go out in the crowd and just, all we're asking you to do is ask if anybody has seen him. That's all we need you to do. Can you please do that without messing it up too bad? We'll expect you to mess up a few times. Tell you what, actually take 10 of these because you're probably gonna lose them. You'll probably walk out with the Sabo picture and it'll blow away in the wind. So, so here's 20 of them, here's 20 pictures. You could drop some, you know, a bird can take some of them away or whatever just please go around and just ask to see if anybody's seen them that's all we all need from you okay and spondum's like okay i don't know all right so next we see uh jewelry bonnie uh, in her child form and she is stowing away on the ship of the tajin kingdom now the tajin kingdom was ruled by queen uh Mororolona. uh there's a lot of r's and o's in her names uh, in her name okay and uh that kingdom is actually the parallel to our morocco and the reason that it is that is because first of all tajin i believe is a dish native to morocco and northern africa also when she first appeared at the reverie she was the one that was carrying the wine glasses right and she was walking around at reverie and the literally the first thing she says is she quotes casablanca which casablanca takes place in morocco and so she's like here's looking at you world you know so it's it's obviously a reference to morocco so bonnie is heading to morocco uh, she's going to have a layover there for a little while before she catches her flight over to Egghead. And then we have Sabo. Sabo is in the, uh, the uh, what was it, the bilge. He's in the bilge. Uh, what is the bilge on a ship? You'd think after all the years of reading One Piece, I'd know what the bilge is, um, you know. But uh, let me let me know. Anyway, so yeah, he's hiding in the bilge. Uh, and it's uh, he's, he's looking banged up, guys. I mean, Sabo is bleeding, like, really bad. Here's another thing. 
I brought this up when I did the Eam video this week. So, Sabo was running away from Eam. Eam, like, slashed him with his, like, demon tail. And, yeah, I understand that, like, okay... I imagine it's something beyond hockey and Devil Fruit abilities, you know, I like to think it's beyond that, like, because Eam might be, like, the creator god or, like, Mother Ocean, um, and might be the opposite of Devil Fruit users that, it, you know, any attack against a Devil Fruit user is gonna hurt a lot. But Sabo looks like, if that's the only injury he got, I mean, granted, he got stabbed, but Sabo is the chief of staff of the Revolutionary Army. I don't think that, you know, he's been in battles before where he's gotten some serious injuries. This cannot be the first time he's ever gotten stabbed in the gut, you know what I mean? It looks like he's losing a lot of blood, he's fading in and out of consciousness, he does not look good right now, okay? Now, he might have also gotten attacked more because we just don't know what happened. After Cobra got up and, and, and said the, the letter that Lily left, and then he gets killed by Eam. I guess Sabo gets away. Maybe he got attacked again. But, you know, the idea is maybe Eam is the opposite of Devil Fruit users, and that's why Eam was able to injure Sabo. There's another idea. Because if you go back and you look at the panel, the panel when the tail is first about to stab Cobra, like the first attack that happens, okay? You can see something dripping off of the tail, off of the devil tail. And so, because everything's in silhouette, it looks like ink or paint, like black paint. But what if it's water? What if Eam, I'm, I'm really going along with this Eam is Mother Ocean kind of shit right now. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It was a popular theory because Umi is, you know, I am you, so U M I. But like, if Eam literally is the ability, like, like the ocean manifest, transforms into the ocean, also like the shape-shifting ability might just be water transformation, you know? And so then, here's a tail that embodies the power of the sea in this attack. Sabo got stabbed by that thing. He was like, ah! You know, it was like the most pain he's ever felt. He looked pretty banged up from that, so that might be the reason right there. Sabo's there, clinging to consciousness. He's holding his gut wound. He, has, he doesn't have anything to bandage it up up with. He's literally just lying passed out in the bilge of this ship. Like, he doesn't even have any, like, like gauze or anything to, like, patch himself up with. So he's just there, like, holding his, his open wound, and he's like, oh god, I gotta make it to Lelucia. So he's heading to Lelucia, obviously. Lelucia, I don't think, has a direct correlation to a, a place on our world, although um, it is ruled by a vampire named King Seki. So... Transylvania, Romania, I guess? Alright, so, uh... Wapple and Vivi are going to Greece, Bonnie's going to Morocco, and Sabo's going to Romania. All right, is everybody on board with that? Okay, great. If any of you, if anybody watching this lives in any of those countries, please, you know, prepare for their arrival. They, they've been through a lot, okay? They've all been through a lot. All right. So, um, the narrator comes on again and says, you know, it did not take long for these two key stories to spread across the world. The murder of Cobra by Sabo, that dastardly revolutionary army member, and of course, the disappearance of his daughter, Nefotari Vivi. Okay, so these are the two stories that spread really quickly, okay? So now we're cutting to uh, the Room of Authority in uh, Castle Pangea. This is a little bit after the Reverie has concluded where we see the five Gorosei, all right? And they're sitting around and they're mentioning that, man, we were really going to deal with this whole egghead situation right after Reverie. So that was like the original schedule. Their original docket was like immediately after Reverie deal with Vegapunk. Like, they wrote that down on their, their schedule. Like, okay, we gotta deal with this Vegapunk situation, because he might be, you know, to be a traitor or whatever, and then the whole call that York made, you know, all that stuff. So they're like, alright, we're gonna deal with that after Revery. But now that this whole thing has happened, Sabo busted in, and Cobra, you know, got killed, and now Sabo escaped with all this information, so now they gotta deal with that right now, okay? So they're discussing that. He all, They also bring up that, like, ah, oh, this Sabo, it's rather interesting that this Sabo keeps running across people with the letter D in their names. Um, you know, Sabo, you know, brother of Ace and Luffy, and then just every dragon, you know, Monkey D, dragon. So, they're, they're noting that similarity. Sabo is going to have a point to play in this story. And I think it also ties back to what Ace called him last chapter in the flashback, where it's like, hey, do you want the initial D in your name, Sabo? Alright, well, you'll be Sad Bo, or Sad Boy, almost like a parallel to Joy Boy. So, I'm thinking you know, Luffy and Sabo, they're gonna have a major part to play in this. Uh, Sabo especially, okay? Obviously Luffy, he's the main character of the story, but Sabo's, his part is not just like 
break into Marijua, see what's going on, relay it back to Dragon, and then Dragon takes it from there. No, Sabo's going to have a role to play in this, okay? So while they're discussing that, they get a call from Eam. Eam is still chilling out over in the garden room, in the room of flowers, and uh, is a lot more vocal now. Eam is just like, you know, calling them up on the Den Den Mushi, and is just like, the time has come to put Vegapunk's new invention to the test. The Mother Flame. All right, that's a pretty cool name for the uh, for the uh, item, for the uh, device. The device. Um, this is the object, the unidentified flying object that was above Lelucia that nuked the entire kingdom. A lot of people thought it was an ancient weapon. Um, there was a theory out there that perhaps it was not an ancient weapon, but maybe it was an artificial ancient weapon. That seems to be the idea here. Uh, maybe uh, Vegapunk took schematics or a design or a concept from Uranos, which is the sky weapon. We don't know what it looks like yet, but Uranos, god of the sky, sky weapon, nuke, laser beams, you know, that's how it goes, and then created this thing, the Mother Flame. You know what? Later on in the chapter, Dragon even brings it up. He's like, you know, Vegapunk, no, it was Ivankov. Ivankov's like, Dra Dragon, Vegapunk would never invent something that could destroy entire countries, and Dragon's like, I know, I know, and I'm like, ah! Uh, listen, um, we've only known Vegapunk, like the fan base has only known Vegapunk for like a dozen chapters or so, and, and I think even we can kind of come to the conclusion like, yeah, that kind of tracks a little bit, you know? Um, but anyway, yeah, so Eam is now, you know, setting up for the destruction of Lelucia, and so it's like, yes, we will test out the Mother Flame, the world-destroying laser battleship or whatever. And so the Gorosei are just kind of like, Huh, all right, well, yeah, I guess we could do that too. I mean, we have the whole thing with Vegapunk to deal with and the Sabo thing to deal with, but yeah, I guess we could test the world destroying super laser. If that's what Eam wants, that's what Eam gets, you know what I mean? And so they're like, all right, well, where are we gonna test this thing? I mean, we've never really done this before. It is like, okay. And uh, one of the Gordo say, Samurai Gandhi, he uh, throws out the idea as like, hey, maybe we should, uh, we should probably test this in a remote area. Like, you know how we would test like nukes or H-bombs in our world, you know, you don't, you don't drop them on, you know, populated, well, okay, you know, World War II. But, like, the idea is you, when you're testing them, you use it in, like, a desert or in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of, like, northern Russia in a distillate island like the Tsar Bomba, you know? And so, you know, he's being pragmatic about this. You know, he's just like, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll find an isolated area you know, like the equivalent of like northern Canada in the One Piece world, and we'll, we'll drop, the, drop the nuke up there. And so Eam is like, no, it's going to be Lelucia. And they're like, you know, honestly, they do object to it as much as they do. They're just kind of like, uh, we, we have Gorbachev, the dude with the mustache. He's like, Lelucia, huh? Well, you know, a lot of people live there. That is of no concern. Okay, well, just wanted to make sure you knew that. And so um, you, you have uh, Gone Fall there, and he's like, understood, the world moves at the beat of its creator. So right here, we have Gondorf, Gone Fall, literally calling Eam the creator of the world. Now, whether that just be because Eam is their boss and they're really sucking up to him, or it's like, no, Eam is literally the mother of Earth, the mother of the ocean, the creator of life, yada, yada, yada. So that's literally the title they're giving them. Um, that could be a thing. And then we also have Sanji's uncle, who's like, hmm, what, what is the reason for Lelucia's selection? So this is a thing where the Goro say, I would imagine at this point the idea that maybe the Gorosei are fragments of Eam's self is maybe not really on the table because they're, they're kind of objecting to this. They're kind of like, okay, Eam, listen, We'll do whatever you say. Literally, your wish is our command, but there's just a couple of things that we want to bring to your attention. You want to test the world-destroying super laser on an extremely populated island. Just making sure you know that. Why exactly are you picking that one, by the way? And so that if it's like, if the Gorosei were fragments of Eam, there would like, like, just like puppets and mindless, then there'd be no objection at all. There would be like, we will destroy Lelucia. Okay. And then that would be it, right? So maybe their powers, their individual abilities might come from Eam. Like the, like, like, I will give you the godly form of a Quetzalcoatl or whatever like that. But in this, in the case with this, um, they do have their own agency and they can't object to certain decisions that Eam is making. Not really objecting, they're just, they didn't say like, we can't do that, they just said like, there's a lot of people that live there, are you sure you want to do that? Yes. Why? Because it's close. 
Okay, yep, that's a reason. We'll do it. We'll get right to it. All right, that's just how we'll, we'll prepare for all the, the fallout from this, both figuratively and very literally. Okay, and so this is interesting because you want to you want to wonder, you know, Saba was heading to Lelucia and then they nuke Lelucia. And it's like, well, did Eam know that Sabo was there? And it seemed like from what the Gorosei said back then that they did not. Um, the idea was like, oh, we're going to eliminate Lelucia. Oh, but Sabo was at Lelucia. Oh! Well, that just kills two birds with one stone right there. Like, they didn't know he was heading there, okay? They just picked it because it's close. So that also kind of gives you another border for Eam's abilities. Eam does not have some, like, even if Eam is like Mother Ocean, Eam does not have omniscience and omnipotence to the point where, like, I know where everybody is at all times, you know, like, like actual godly abilities like that. Eam did not know where Sabo went. Eam did not know Sabo was at Lelucia. It was just a coincidence. It really seems that way. There's no reason for Eam to lie to the Gorosei. Eam would not be like, you know, what's the wh what's the reason why you're targeting Lelucia, Eam Sama? Because Sabo is there. Oh wait, no, I can't tell the Gorosei that. Uh, because it's close proximity. There'd be no reason. You would just say because that is where the infiltrator is heading. Like, ah, that is where Sabo's going. Very well, Eam, fire away. No, it doesn't seem to be the situation there. So. Now we get the names and titles of all five of the Gorosei. So they are all given the title of Warrior God. God, mind you. Now, once again, this could just be for dramatic effect. We've, you know, we've all watched anime before. We all know there's groups like the Nine Demon Gods or whatever like that. You know what I mean? So it might not be literal, but considering, you know, Endgame One Piece and this series has been going on for a quarter of a century and Eam is maybe the ocean deity, so perhaps their abilities are well and far beyond just regular ass mythical zones. Maybe it's a whole other category. We had regular zones. We had carnivorous zones. I guess we have vegetarian zones or herbivore zones. Uh, we also have ancient zones. We have mythical zones like dragons and wolf deities and sun gods and everything. But oh, what if it's even beyond that? What if like Luffy's fruit is a mythical zone, but there's a special subcategory of the subcategory. It's god zones. The ability of literally having a deity. So it's like regular mythical zones are like Kaido, you know, it's, you know, uh, or like uh, Marco's Phoenix, like Phoenix, dragons, those are mythical animals. But then gods are like the next level of that. I don't think a lot of people would compare to like, you know, oh, that's a griffin. That's the same thing as like the god of fire or the god of war, you know? It's like they're both cool. Like a phoenix is cool, but there's a phoenix and then there's the god of war, you know? So yeah, it might be the thing like that where they each have the ability of like a godly mythical zone and they could go to the next level or it's a power that's not related to devil fruits at all and it's directly given to them by Eam, okay? So first and foremost, we uh, have St. J. Garcia Saturn, who is of course named after the planet Saturn, and he is the Defense Science War God. So they all have titles that are like kind of elaborate. Some of them are actually kind of funny. So I will I will read through the rest now and uh, probably put some really cool foreboding music in the background, and then we'll we'll break them down individually. All right, here we go. <clears throat> the five elder planets. Environmental War God, Saint Marcus Mars. Justice Warrior God, Top Man Valkyrie. Finance War God, Ethan Baron V. Nusjoro. Agriculture War God, Shepherd Jew Peter. Woo! Okay, so obviously Saint J. Garcia Saturn is Saturn. My favorite is Gonfall, who is officially now known as Saint Marcus Mars. You got the alliteration in there, you got Mars in the name, Marcus Mars. Love it. He is my favorite by far. I hope he lives. I hope he survives. I always kind of liked Gonfall, you know what I mean? Gonfall's brother, Gondoff, whatever, okay? So he is the environmental war god, all right? So... I mean, their titles kind of are self-explanatory, you know? The defensive science dude handles the science development in the world. Probably is also responsible for limiting science development rather than expanding it. You know, like, there's a reason the One Piece world doesn't have flying machines. Like, I imagine at some point in the world, beyond Vegapunk and Egghead, there has to be some people that are like, I developed a flying machine! Hey, Meredith, come on out here! I developed some kind of helicopter-type device. Yeah, that's when Cypherpole shows up and and they're like, oh, that's that's great. And then they start destroying the thing and like murder the family. It's like, oh no, my 
my helicopter? You know, so I think his job is probably more or less, you know, containing technology. Vegapunk is okay because he's on the government payroll. So, like, he's the only one that develops technology. And even then, they're putting a crackdown on him right now, you know? So then we have Marcus Mars, who is the environmental war god. Um, I, I don't know, man. I guess he handles pollution in the world. You know, the air quality level and, and stuff like that. Um, then we have probably my second favorite, Top Man Valkyrie. This is Gorbachev. This is the dude with the giant mustache. Um, and he is the Justice Warrior God. So he oversees probably everything going on at like Eni's Lobby and all the judiciary systems. He's probably the ultimate authority on the God's Knights. We're actually going to be introduced to a member of the God's Knights later, the one that actually passes decisions, like the Chief Justice of the God's Knights, as it were, comparing it to like the, uh, the United States uh, Supreme Court system. But he's the justice warrior god. I'm assuming he's the final authority for all this. Well, I guess Eam is the final authority for everything, but you know what I mean. So he's top man Valkyrie. Now, Valkyrie, the idea is, and there's a lot of comparisons here, to uh, Mercury. So that's why we're going to go with Mercury with him. There's one name that's kind of not really obvious, but it's kind of just process of elimination. So, But top man Valkyrie, I think, is Mercury. And that works great, because his was the silhouette last time that was like the large tusks or mustache, and has the little feathers on the head that I compared to Mercury's helmet and I was like oh what if he was Mercury now I kind of was like well Gorbachev like the actual Gorbachev has the birthmark on his forehead that like red spot and uh, this dude has it as well and I was thinking well Jupiter has a red spot on it the great red spot of Jupiter so he could be Jupiter as well but no I'm gonna go with the first idea because it makes more sense like he has the little feathers on his head because he's Mercury so I'll, I'll take it um, then we have Sam Samurai Gandhi, who is now Ethan Baron V. Nus Juro. All right, so it's kind of like Zoro Juro, kind of like a Wano naming scheme with the last uh, word there, but Ethan Baron. So there you go. It just, just names Ethan. Not Samurai Gandhi, just Ethan. Hi, Ethan. How are you doing? So, just kind of by process of elimination, and he does have a V in his name, he probably most likely represents the planet of Venus, because the last one, and by the way, he is the finance war god, which, or warrior god. So I gotta love that, you know, we have, like, the greatest, strongest beings in One Piece, and it's like, I command the powers of Saturn! But I also, you know, defensive science, I'm going to run the numbers over here. And then finance warrior god is just like, oh, yes, I'm over here, the accountant. You know, he's the accountant. He goes in the back room and just like, there's just like a bunch of like uh, people working in cubicles behind the room of authority. And, you know, Ethan walks in and he's just like, hey, crew, how's everybody doing? Oh, we're good, Ethan. We're just, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, v. Nusjoro. Yes, we are just crunching the numbers over here. This reverie, oh, man, the catering, there's a lot of, a lot of finance and Involved here. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Well, I'll tell you what, today's uh, casual Fridays, so, uh, you know, it might be something like that. I'm kind of disappointed Samurai Gandhi wasn't Mars, like the war god, but whatever. And then finally, we have Sanji's uncle, or Judge's brother, the blonde Gorosei, the youngest looking one, and he is the agriculture war god. I keep saying war god, warrior god, which, eh, potato, potato. Um, Shepherd Jew Peter. Okay. So, Jew Peter, as in J U, space, Peter, Jupiter. There it is. Okay, so Jupiter. Also, I don't know if it might just be this translation, but Saturn and Mars both have Saint in front of their names Saint J. Garcia Saturn, Saint Marcus Mars. And Top Man Valkyrie, Ethan Baron, and Shepard do not have the Saint in front of their name. Don't know if that's significant, or if it's something the translators forgot, or if it's just literally not on the page. Maybe something Oda did, but that's weird that two of them have the saint title and the other three do not. So weird. So, yeah, we have one that was... So the ones that are obvious are Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter, because it's, like, in their names. I think the Valkyrie one is pretty on the nose, especially when you look at the way it's written. So we're going to go with uh, Valkyrie, Mercury on that one. And then the only one left process of elimination is Venus. There's a V in the guy's name. Uh, Earth is probably going to be something separate. And then you have the three ancient weapons as Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So there you go. And then Luffy is the sun. Okay, so there you go. So it's, hello there, Top Man. And Top Man is not even wearing a top hat. Come on, Oda, really? His name's Top Man, you can't give him a top hat to wear? 
Next time we see him, I want to see him wearing a top hat and a cane, damn it. Like the Monopoly guy with the mustache and everything. Those are the names of the five Garosei and their individual titles. I'll, I'll explore that later in another video. We can really delve into the, um, the weight of what it means to be the finance warrior god. <laughs> Imagine that. If you, okay, if anybody out there is an accountant, okay, if anybody out there is an accountant that deals with finance or anything like that, and you're like the manager of a firm or something, or what, like middle management or something, how badass would that be? I'm going to walk into work and be like, you know what? My title is now not middle manager of the finance group or whatever. I am now the warrior god of finance. Like, that's great, sir. You got 10 calls. It's like, all right, just wanted to say that. Okay. So, um, it happens. Like, the Lucia gets nuked. It gets obliterated. We were there for that. We saw it. Um, and then also Eam states, one more thing. Yes, Lord Eam, anything you wish. Retrieve Vivi. Yes, sir. Of course. Doesn't say yes, sir. Just says as you wish. So, uh, retrieve Vivi. That's the other objective here. So, they are going to definitely be looking for Vivi with every single, um, uh, every facet, every arm of the world government, Marines, Cypherpool, are going to be extended to try to bring Vivi back to Marie Joie now. This is an EAM order. That is a big deal, all right? They're going to be looking for her, okay? So now we cut back to Marine HQ very briefly, where we have um, we have Akainu there, and they're just like, ah, oh, the Kingdom of Tajin and the Aegis Kingdom are both rebelling. So those are the kingdoms Bonnie ended up going to, and uh, of course, uh, Wapple and Vivi ended up going to anyway. And we already know the Lelucia Kingdom is rebelling. So really, I think I don't think this is coincidence. I think Bonnie and Sabo, um, maybe not Wapple and Vivi, that might have just been blind luck. But I think Bonnie was aware that the Tajin Kingdom maybe might have been rebelling. So that's the ship she picked to get on. And Sabo definitely wanted to go to Lelucia. So he's like, Okay, I'm gonna pick that ship. Sabo might have also picked that ship, not just because the Revolutionary Army was already there and they, they liberated it from Peachbeard, but also just because um, it was close and he was bleeding out, and he's like, I gotta get somewhere soon, <laughs> or I'm gonna die, you know what I mean? So yeah, it might have been a situation like that. So... They mention that because the warlord system has been abolished um, and all these countries are in open rebellion right now, uh, the marines kind of have their hands full. However, the military power has already gone in a new direction. And with that being said, we are now referring to the seraphim. So we get to see the three other seraphim. We get to see S. Flamingo, who's Do Flamingo seraphim. Um, it might be S. Gecko, but I'm thinking it's probably S. Bats, because yes, Gecko Moria, Gecko is in his name, but the pun there is not a Gecko, it's a Bat, because in Japanese it's Komori, so Gecko Mori a uh. There it is, that's the pun. So it's probably S. Bats, and actually we see on the neck of Moria's Seraphim PX5, um, uh, I think it is. So I think he's Seraphim number 5. We know Jinbei was number 4. I don't think we know the numbers of any, other, uh, any of the other ones, other than uh, S. Shark, who's Jinbei's. I like to think the first Seraphim that was created was Kuma, because they already had all of his DNA on, on backlog anyway. Probably Kuma was first, S. Bear was number 1, and then Boa was number 2, since that she was imprisoned at Marie Joie. She was a slave for years. They probably had her DNA as well. So then S. Snake was number two. Mihawk was S. Three. And then Jinbei's S. Shark. S. Hawk was S well, number three. And then S. Shark was number four. S. Bat is number five. And I don't think we see the numbers super clear on Doflamingos or Crocodiles. We see Crocodiles as well. Crocodiles, Seraphim, S. Crocodile. Uh, S. Alligator. So Doflamingo Seraphim looks like Doflamingo, like when he was a kid, you know, the smirk on his face, like, ha, 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 you know, so, you know, he's going to be a little shit, you know. And then you have S-Bat, who's laughing maniacally, kind of looks like S-Bat's hair is on fire. Now, Moria's hair was already very spiky, but they have Lunarian DNA, so the flame, so it might literally just be fire hair. And then you have S-Crocodile, who looks rather somber, looks rather sad, looks just kind of like, hmm. And then we have um, the statement that Crocodile is on Kalibali Island, so they're going after them. So they're sending out the Seraphim, maybe not all to Kalibali, but they're sending them to different areas to like bring in various pirates. This is something that's very important to mention, the way that like the Marines have their hand full, but this new military power is happening now. So the Marines might actually eventually turn, or some of the Marines might turn on the government. Like the idea of the Seraphim, like taking, like what does this mean for the future of the Marines? Are we just all gonna be like, 
replaced by clone troopers <laughs> later? Like, is that what's going to happen? So some of the Marines, like Sakazuki included, might be against this and might push back on it. And he might, maybe there might be a little bit of a schism or like rebellion in the Marines of like, you know, th this is weird. Let's not do the like the clone trooper shit. That it didn't work in Star Wars. It's not going to work now. You know what I mean? Um, I haven't watched Star Wars. And maybe the clone troopers did work. I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen Attack of the Clones in years. Did they all die? They all live. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, so we get to see these seraphim. It's also important to mention Crocodile Seraphim, S. Crocodile, has the scar on his face like Crocodile has. Crocodile did not have that scar when he was a kid because Oda drew him as a kid. Also, it makes no sense for him to have that scar. He's a clone. <laughs> Unless the scar is like etched into his DNA, which... Like, that's kind of going Torico with it, like gourmet cells a little bit there. But, like, I, I don't know, I don't know. It's it's so weird that maybe maybe Crocodile, maybe S. Crocodile did that to himself. Like, he was born out of the tank, and, like, you are, S, uh, you are PX7 S. Crocodile. And the first thing he did was take a knife and, like, make him the scar because he felt more comfortable with that scar. Maybe that's, like, they retained memories. We already know they retained memories, like, at least fragments of their memories from their original bodies. So, might be something like that. So now we finally cut back to uh, the Kamabaka Kingdom because this entire flashback was a framing device for Sabo explaining what he saw at Reverie. So Dragon and Ivankov have been listening to this entire story. They heard all of it, like Eam, the Gorosei's monster forms, Death of Cobra, everything, okay? Sabo mentions as soon as we arrived at Lelucia, the people rebelled, and they, you know, because they were riled up by Bello Betty and everybody. They uh, captured Seki and uh, his uh, daughter Komain, and they threw them in jail. They threw them in the prison, and then the island was nuked, so they're most likely dead right now. Um, but then they found Sabo hiding in the bilge, and it's just like, oh, you're Sabo, you're the Flame Emperor, you killed Cobra! And Sabo was going to explain to them, I didn't kill Cobra, it was a misunderstanding, but they were all inspired by him slaying a member of the government, so they're like, oh, okay. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm the Flame Emperor. <laughs> uh, do, do you have some blood? I really need blood. <laughs> it's like, well, it's a great thing you're in Transylvania. The king stockpiled a bunch of it. Type A, Type B. What do, what do you, what do you need? Just like, yeah. So, um, yeah. So Sabo, that's how he, you know, came to be at Lelucia. They patched him up. They healed him, and then the whole situation happened with the country being wiped out. All right. Now, the way that Sabo did this was that he did not call the revolutionary, because he wanted to contact them, obviously. It was also on Lelucia when he read the newspaper, and he's like, Sabo kills Cobra? That, that didn't happen? That's fake news! You know what I mean? And so Sabo wanted to contact them, but he did not have access to a white Denden Mushi, which is the encryption Denden Mushi. So he had to kind of think outside the box on this. So after he healed up, and after he was ready to head back to Kamabaka with all of the uh, revolutionary recruits, like uh, Moda and everybody, they get on a boat, they sail away. But before they were out of range of Lelucia, Sabo basically did like a um, he, he did like a rerouted call. So basically, what he did is he took a Denden Den Mushi, he used that Denden Den Mushi to call a Denden Den Mushi on the mainland of Lelucia. And then they kind of just took two Denden Den Mushis and put them together. So this is the one that was called, that Sabo is speaking through, and this is the one that Dragon is receiving. And instead of like them doing it directly, they just kind of put two Denden Den Mushis together to reroute the call. It's the same tactic that Rick Sanchez would use years later as a pickle to take out an entire embassy. That was the yeah. yeah. So there you go. Um, but no, that's what he did. That was a smart move. And so because of that, the government intercepted the call. Although the uh, the interception division intercepted no calls that day. We're all aware of that. Um, but that's, you know, they received the call. It's like, oh, this is Sabo from Lelucia. And that's where they thought it was coming from. And it's like, oh, well, this is convenient. We were going to blow it up anyway. And then, like, just blasted the island. Sabo was not on the island. He was outside the island on a ship. And they got to witness it completely obliterated in front of them. So Sabo relays the information that there was a dark shadow above the clouds. This was not natural. This was not any kind of weather phenomenon that I'd ever seen before. Keep in mind, it's the Grand Line. So, you know, that's also up in the air. You can't rule it out. Like, there were those giant things that Thriller barks. So, you know. But from what Sabo understood, it's like, th this thing was man-made. All right? So they're talking about that. And so um, they bring up at this point that, like, wait a second, enormous shadow, uh, like in a moment everything was gone in a flashing light. Um, there's no way that thing was caused by a natural event. And so that's when they think, oh, it must have been um, some kind of device. Uh, it might be 
you know, it might be something invented by Vegapunk, and to which then Dragon says, oh, that he would never do that, which, I don't know. Maybe they're like, ah, yes, Vegapunk, uh, we, the Gorosei, command you to build a giant laser cannon! Oh, Quasar, that doesn't sound like it would be for peace. Would it be for peace? Are there any peace applications to the giant laser cannon? Uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, yes. We will use it for peace and nothing else. Well, okay, Quasar, I'll get right on it. Giant peace laser, okay. You know, so, um, Vegapunk is very, uh, I wouldn't say gullible. He's very naive. He, we, we've learned that about him. So, uh, the idea that Ivankov was like, ah, uh, there's only one person on the planet that can make something like that. Uh, like, yeah. He wouldn't, though, would he? Like, well... Yeah, I mean, there's also six satellites, too. Lilith would probably make something like that. York might have had a hand in it. Who knows? Um, let's just not... Let's, let's not put all the blame on Vegapunk's main body here, okay? Um, so also something that we get brought up is a little bit more information about Eam themselves. So, um, yes, it turns out that Eam actually was one of the 20 families, uh, or, or Eam's family, the name Eam, comes from e Saint Eam of House Nerona. Okay, so Nerona, it's a completely different house name. We've never heard it before, at least I don't think we have. Uh, there might be a deep dive into One Piece. Somebody might be like, oh, the house name Nerona was mentioned all the way back in Skypea. It's like, maybe, but I don't remember it off the cuff, so if anybody else has any connections to that, let me know. But, uh, you know, Saint Eam of House Nerona. So, Eam was one of the original 20 that founded the world government. Ivankov kind of starts doing uh, theories here. You know it's fun when the One Piece characters in the story start theorizing. Like, Ivankov's like... I I need to start a new, I need to go start a new YouTube channel to start talking about my One Piece theories. Go and subscribe to Ivankov's YouTube channel, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of really st fun stuff on there. Um, you know, so anyway, Ivankov is like, hey, um, we already know about a devil fruit that grants eternal youth, and that's, of course, the op-op fruit. And Ivankov throws down, like, the devil fruit encyclopedia. Like, we know the op-op fruit can provide internal, eternal youth. So maybe it was somebody that had that power, passed it down. So it's almost like that's, like, the first thing they come to. I love that, because that's been a theory for a while. If Eam is around for 800 years, might be because of the eternal youth operation. That was a theory pretty much everybody immediately jumped on. So whether or not the fact that Oda's bringing it up so obviously here is, like, is he setting it up to be a a red herring like we, we like the most obvious thing is that it's a human that ate a devil fruit that became eternally youthful or immortal or could there be something else going on behind the scenes here who knows right um let's see i mean it could be possible like like saint eam could have been a regular person back in the day but then it could have been possessed by the ocean god or something and that's why they're living 800 years you know it doesn't have to be the op op fruit but that is an option that's on the table um let's see here uh th there's also the idea they also throw out the idea that like listen it could just be a coincidence maybe this person is just using the name or maybe it's a descendant of the original saint eam uh or they're just messing with everybody and just taking the title for themselves so that's also on the table you got to remember occam's razor like the simplest solutions usually the easiest one then again this is a world with magic powers and devil fruits and sun gods so you can't really just occam's razor kind of takes on a whole new meaning in the one piece universe you can't really rely on that too much um but there is option it might not be some immortal god or being it, it might just be someone that was a descendant of the original house nerona family and then just like uses the name just to be cool or whatever edgy or something right that's also a possibility there um all right so yeah then they bring up the ancient weapons and then they say okay well if vegapunk didn't build this thing then maybe it's just an actual ancient weapon and the and dragon brings up the rebuttal to that of like well we learned from robin the ancient weapons do exist that's important to bring up the revolution did not know the ancient weapons were a real thing it was just it was just myth it was just history and just like oh like i'm reading about this oh the ancient weapon pluton is that a real thing like they weren't sure until robin you know, lived with them on Baltigo for two years during the time skip and relay the information. Oh no, no, they're real. They're out there. I mean, the Poneglyphs talk about them all the time. They are most likely real objects. And so that's when Dragon learned about it. But it's like, hey, if the ancient weapons are real and the government had them, why not use the why use them now? Why not use them earlier than this? And earlier in the chapter, I forgot to bring this up when I was reading off all the Gorosei names. I think it was Sanji's uncle that brought it up. He's like, if only we could instantly... Oh, no, it was uh, Samurai Gandhi. If we could use that power freely. So the implication was this mother flame device that Vegapunk invented for the Gorosei... Um, 
it has like a really hard, a really high cooldown period, or has to recharge. Cannot be used repeatedly. Um, and the way they talk about it, it might not even be able to be used. Like it might take a year or several years to power back up again, or something like that. They they mention they cannot use it all the time. So I feel like if it was a real ancient weapon, then it, it could be used all the time. But this is an artificial construct, so it's like. And Vegapunk, that was one of the reasons they brought up at Egghead. Like we don't understand how this Iron Giant ran. We don't understand the power source it used. Like we just can't wrap our heads around it um, and so that way they, they just don't understand it so the same thing with the uh, the uh, mother flame Vegapunk's like I invented this giant peace laser uh, but you can only fire it once every 10 years that's how long it takes for the battery to recharge sorry I just don't understand the power system yet you know could be something like that so now we cut to the last scene of the chapter where we cut back to Marijua, where we see a new character introduced. They are um, the Supreme Commander of the God's Knights, so basically like the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, okay? And we have his name, Garling Figarland, okay? And the Figarland family is, of course, related to Shanks. We learned that from film Red. So this person could be Shanks' dad, for all we know, okay? And so he's really badass. He's wearing this really long coat, black coat, with the world government buttons on it. And he has this really cool saber, which is kind of indicative of, of Shanks' kind of design. It's like a similar kind of saber design with, like, the, the guard and, like, the hand guard and everything like that. His hair is shaped like a crescent moon. So his, he's an older man, so he has, like, uh, his gray hair kind of doing this up here and then he has a beard that kind of curves upwards so and then on the side it kind of goes kind of like Hiralux hair a little bit honestly imagine Hiralux if he's styled with a lot of gel if uh, Hiralux had a lot of beard gel and like you know um, you know uh, molding cream or whatever and he kind of like you know move this down here like he grew a beard and stuff kind of like that a little bit right and uh, he has glasses and uh, yeah he was the original king of God Valley we don't know what happened with God Valley, but this dude used to rule over it, and now he has the title as the Supreme Ruler of the God's Knights. So you know this guy was a big head honcho, he's a big deal, okay? The Figarland family, also one of the 20 founding families, so now we know, uh, what was it, Nerona? Uh, yeah, Nerona, ooh! I wonder if that's, uh, that, you know, that might be Verona's last name. Verona Nerona. <laughs> <laughs> from One Piece D&D. &D. Verona was royalty this entire time! It was Verona Nerona! I knew it! Alright, anyway. Um, the, uh, the statement that this person, the, the narrator kind of comes on and says that the Supreme Commander Garling Figarland has now uh, sentenced a member of the Tenerubito to death, which is a big deal. And the person that is sentenced to death is none other it's not Charlos, unfortunately. It's Mules Guard, of course. Don Quixote, Mules Guard. We see him kind of like crucified a little bit. We see him like on the cross of the world government sigil, like the five, like the cross with the circles in it. And he's on the cross like this, and he's bloodied and broken. I don't know if he's dead yet, but he looks pretty dead. I mean, he's bleeding. So it's like you've been sentenced to death. Anyone who protects scum is lower than the scum they protect. That is what Garling Figarland, the Supreme Commander of the God's Knights, states. All the other Tenerobito are cheering him on, like, yeah, execute him, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. So I don't know if Mule's Guard is dead yet, but he looks pretty damn dead. And now we're going on a multiple week break. Um, and, and so because of that, it's, it's, it's debatable. It's like four week break, five week break. I'm imagining it's however long it takes Oda to recover from his eye surgery, uh, which by the way is remarkable that he was able to draw as well as he could with his, like he mentions like, oh my, my eyes are blurry. I need to get this surgery done. So it, it's whenever he's back up and rolling, he can actually see and draw again after he's recovered. It'll be fine. But yeah, that's the end of the chapter. I'm guessing Mule's guard is just dead. Uh, we kind of knew this was going to happen. Well, actually, you know what? I didn't because I was thinking, like, okay, punishment for the uh, Tenerubito. I was thinking the worst punishment they could give is not death, but forcing them to live in the lower realm. And to be fair, every other Tenerubito, that would be a fate worse than death. However, uh, with, the case, with the case of Mule's Guard, he liked living with the common people. He kind of wanted to. Uh, kind of said, well, I guess he didn't because he was trying to change the uh, Tenerubito system. But sending him to live in the lower realm wouldn't be really much of a punishment, so they just decided to kill him. So yeah, the God's Knights don't mess around. They're not like, oh, yes, we are now here to... Punish Mule's God. Um, yes, he attacked Charlos and ordered pirates to attack him. And okay, we're just gonna give him a light slap on the wrist. We're also going to downgrade his mansion from ten stories tall 
to seven stories tall. You know, it's not going to be anything like that. It's straight up. This guy is like, no, you went against every single core foundation of the Tenry Veto, what the Celestial Dragons stand for. You are now to be executed for your actions. So they do have the death penalty. They do not mess around with this kind of shit. All right. If Don Quixote Homing would have stayed at Marijua and would have expounded his uh, philosophy more, he might have ended up here, dead as Mulesgard did. Okay. So they don't mess around. Mulesgard tried his best and it still didn't work out. It's like, that's the rule. Tenorabito can do anything they want in the world, but if you turn on your own, they do not have any mercy. There will be no quarter here, okay? No quarters, no dimes, no nickels, no pennies or anything. <sighs> All right, so now we're going on a break. Huh, all right, I gotta think about what stuff to do. What should I do? Last time we did this, I did Law Week. I don't know, any other, what, what, what should I talk about? I don't know. I gotta do the Movie 7 video. Everyone's like, movie seven, which that's the one with, you know, bouncy. So, you know, I could, yeah, definitely I'd talk about that. But yeah, we'll figure out stuff to do. Uh, actually, my mom had um, eye surgery a couple years ago. Uh, the, she had the PRK stuff because her eyes were like really bad. Um, I think she was, uh, she was off work for like a month or so. So that tracks. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about right. But hey, it's, you know, it really helped her out. So I'm sure Oda will be a lot more, you know, better off after his eyes have been fixed as well. So... Good luck to him, and um, there will be other videos from me. He definitely left us with a chapter to discuss a lot. A lot of stuff to unpack with this, definitely. Um, I will do a video on each member of the Gorosei now. We will now delve into what the, the warrior god of finance is really all about. A 45-minute video for each one of them. No, uh, no. I mean, I could, but no. All right. Well, with that being said, I hope you guys all enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks for letting me know about what bilge is, uh, you know, what, what particular part of the, the ship that is, that that's important. And uh, hope you all have a great break. Uh, stay tuned to the channel. There will be content and whatnot. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, dig up some projects that I haven't, uh, you know, worked on in a while and get those taken care of. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, thanks for watching. Teching, signing out. Later, everyone.